The Sworn Sword Part 3 There were red mountains in the distance and white sands beneath his feet. Dunk was digging, plunging a spade into the hot, dry earth and flinging the fine sand back over his shoulder. He was making a hole. A grave, he thought. A grave for hope. A trio of Dornish knights stood watching, making mock of him in quiet voices. Farther off, the merchants waited with their mules and wains and sand sledges. They wanted to be off, but he could not leave until he'd buried Chestnut. He would not leave his old friend to the snakes and scorpions and sand dogs. The stod had died on the long, thirsty crossing between the Prince's Pass and Vaith, with egg upon his back. His front legs just seemed to fold up under him, and he knelt right down, rolled onto his side, and died. His carcass sprawled beside the hole. Already it was stiff. Soon it would begin to smell. Dunk was weeping as he dug, to the amusement of the Dornish knights. "'Water is precious in the waste,' one said." "'You ought not to waste it, sir,' the other chuckled and said. "'Why do you weep? It was only a horse, and a poor one.' "'Chestnut,' Dunk thought, digging. "'His name was Chestnut, and he bore me on his back for years and never bucked or bit.' The old stod had looked a sorry thing beside the sleek sand steeds that the Dornishmen were riding, with their elegant heads, long necks, and flowing manes. But he had given all he had to give. "'Weepin' for a sway-backed stot,' Sir Arlen said, in his old man's voice. "'Why, lad, you never never wept wept for me, me. who put you on his back.' He gave a little laugh, to show he meant no harm by the reproach. That's Dunk the Lunk, thick as a castle castle, 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 castle. He shed no tears for me, either, said Baylor Breakspear from the grave. Though I was his prince, the hope of Westeros. The gods never meant for me to die so young. "'My father was only nine and thirty, said Prince Valar. "'He had it in him to be a great king, the greatest since Aegon the Dragon.' He looked at Dunk with cool blue eyes. "'Why would the gods take him and leave you?' The young prince had his father's light brown hair, but a streak of silver gold ran through it. "'You are Dead, Dunk wanted to scream. You are all three dead. Why don't you leave me be? Sir Arlen had died of a chill, Prince Baylor of the blow his brother dealt him during Dunk's trial of seven, his son Valar during the great spring sickness. I am not to blame for that. We were in Dorn. We never even knew. You were mad the old man told him. We will dig no hole for you when you kill yourself with this folly. In the deep sands a man must hoard his water. Be gone with you, Sir Duncan, Valar said. Be gone. Egg helped him with the digging. The boy had no spade, only his hands, and the sand flowed back into the grave as fast as they could fling it out. It was like trying to dig a hole in the sea. I have to keep digging, Dunk told himself, though his back and shoulders ached from the effort. I have to bury him down deep where the sand dogs cannot find him. I have to... Die? said Big Rob the simpleton from the bottom of the grave. Lying there, so still and cold, with a ragged red wound gaping in his belly. He did not look very big at all. Dunk stopped and stared at him. You're not dead. You're down sleeping in the cellar, 
He looked to Sir Arlen for help. Tell him, sir, he pleaded. Tell him to get out of the grave. Only it was not Sir Arlen of Pennytree standing over him at all. It was Sir Benis of the Brown Shield. The Brown Knight only cackled. Dunk the lunk, he said. Gotten slow, but certain. Never knew a man to live with his entrails hanging out. Red froth bubbled on his lips. He turned and spat, and the white sands drank it down. Treb was standing behind him with an arrow in his eye, weeping slow red tears. And there was wet Watt, too, his head cut near in half, with old Lem and red-eyed Pate and all the rest. They had all been chewing sour leaf with Bennis, Dunk thought at first, but then he realized that it was blood trickling from their mouths. Dead, he thought. All dead, and the brown knight brayed. Ay, so best get busy. You've got more graves to dig, Lunk. Eight for them, and one for me, and one for old Sir Useless. And one last one for your bald dead boy. The spade slipped from Dunk's hands. Egg, he cried. Run! We have to run! But the sands were giving way beneath their feet. When the boy tried to scramble from the hole, its crumbling sides gave way and collapsed. Dunk saw the sands wash over Egg, burying him as he opened his mouth to shout. He tried to fight his way to him, but the sands were rising all around him, pulling him down into the grave filling his mouth, his nose, his eyes. Come the break of day, Sir Benis set about teaching their recruits to form a shield wall. He lined the eight of them up shoulder to shoulder, with their shields touching and their spear points poking through like long, sharp wooden teeth. Then Duncan Egg mounted up and charged them. Maester refused to go within ten feet of the spears and stopped abruptly, but Thunder had been trained for this. The big warhorse pounded straight ahead, gathering speed. Hens ran beneath his legs and flapped away, screeching. Their panic must have been contagious. Once more, Big Rob was the first to drop his spear and run, leaving a gap in the middle of the wall. Instead of closing up, Standfast's other warriors joined the flight. Thunder trod upon their discarded shields before Dunk could rein him up. Woven branches cracked and splintered beneath his iron-shod hooves. Sir Benis rattled off a pungent string of curses as chickens and peasants scattered in all directions. Egg fought manfully to hold his laughter in, but finally lost the battle. Enough of that! Dunk drew Thunder to a halt, unfastened his helm, and tore it off. If they do that in a battle, it will get the whole lot of them killed. And you and me as well, most like. The morning was already hot, and he felt as soiled and sticky as if he'd never bathed at all. His head was pounding, and he could not forget the dream he dreamed the night before. It never happened that way, he tried to tell himself. It wasn't like that. Chestnut had died on the long, dry ride to Vaith. That part was true. He and Egg rode double until Egg's brother gave them Maester. The rest of it, though... I never wept. I might have wanted to, but I never did. He had wanted to bury the horse as well, but the Dornishman would not wait. Sand dogs must eat and feed their pups one of the Dornish knights told him as he helped Dunk strip the stod of saddle and bridle. His flesh will feed the dogs or feed the sands. In a year his bones will be scoured clean. This is Dorn, my friend. Remembering, Dunk could not help but wonder who would feed on Watt's flesh, and Watt's, and Watt's. 
Maybe there are checky fish down beneath the checky water. He rode Thunder back to the tower and dismounted. Egg, help Sir Bennis round them up and get them back here. He shoved his helmet egg and strode to the steps. Sir Eustace met him in the dimness of his solar. That was not well done. No, my lord, said Dunk. They will not serve. A sworn sword owes his liege service and obedience, but this is madness. It was their first time. Their fathers and brothers were as bad or worse when they began their training. My sons worked with them before we went to help the king. Every day for a good fortnight. They made soldiers of them. And when the battle came, my lord? Dunk asked. How did they fare then? How many of them came home with you? The old knight looked long at him. Lem, he said at last. And Pate. And Dake. Dake foraged for us. He was as fine a forager as I ever knew. We never marched on empty bellies. Three came back, sir. Three and me. His mustache quivered. It may take longer than a fortnight. My lord, said Dunk, the woman could be here upon the morrow with all her men. They are good lads, he thought but they will soon be dead lads if they go up against the knights of cold moat. There must be some other way. Some other way. Sir Eustace ran his fingers lightly along the little lion's shield. I will have no justice from Lord Rowan nor this king. He grasped Dunk by the forearm. It comes to me that in days gone by, when the green kings ruled... You could pay a man a blood price if you had slain one of his animals or peasants. A blood price? Dunk was dubious. Some other way, you said. I have some coin laid by. It was only a little claret on the cheek, Sir Benis says. I could pay the man a silver stag and three to the woman for the insult. I could and would if she would take the dam down. The old man frowned. I cannot go to her, however. Not at cold moat. A fat black fly buzzed around his head and lighted on his arm. The castle was ours once. Did you know that, Sir Duncan? Aye, my lord. Sam Stoops had told him. For a thousand years before the conquest, we were the marshals of the North March. A score of lesser lordlings did us fealty, and a hundred landed knights. We had four castles then, and watchtowers on the hills to warn of the coming of our enemies. Coldmoat was the greatest of our seats. Lord Perwin Osgrey raised it. Perwin the Proud, they called him. After the Field of Fire, High Garden passed from kings to stewards and the Osgrays dwindled and diminished. "'Twas Aegon's son, King Magor, who took Coldmoat from us, when Lord Ormond Osgray spoke out against his suppression of the stars and swords, as the poor fellows and the warrior's sons were called. His voice had grown hoarse. "'There is a checky lion carved into the stone above the gates of Coldmoat.' My father showed it to me the first time he took me with him to call on old Reynard Weber. I showed it to my own sons in turn. Adam. Adam served at Coldmoat as a page and squire, and uh, a certain fondness grew up between him and Lord Wyman's daughter. So one winter day I donned my richest raiment and went to Lord Wyman to propose a marriage. His refusal was courteous, but as I left I heard him laughing with Sir Lucas Inchfield. 
I never returned a cold moat after that, save once, when that woman presumed to carry off one of mine own. When they told me to seek for poor Lem at the bottom of the moat. Dake, said Dunk. Bennis says his name was Dake. Dake? The fly was creeping down his sleeve, pausing to rub its legs together the way flies do. Sir Eustace shooed it away and rubbed his lip beneath his mustache. Dake, that was what I said. A staunch fellow, I, I recall him well. He foraged for us during the war. We never marched on empty bellies. When Sir Lucas informed me of what had been done to my poor Dake, I swore a holy vow that I would never again set foot inside that castle unless to take possession. So you see, I cannot go there, Sir Duncan, not to pay the blood price, nor for any other reason. I cannot. Dunk understood. I could go, my lord. I swore no vows. You are a good man, said Duncan, a brave knight and true. Sir Eustace gave Dunk's arm a squeeze. Would that the gods had spared my Alisan. You are the sort of man I had always hoped that she might marry. A true knight, said Duncan, a true knight. Dunk was turning red. I will tell Lady Webber what you said about the blood price, but you will save Sir Bennis from Dake's fate. I know it. I am no mean judge of men, and you are the true steel. You will give them pause, sir, the very sight of you. When that woman sees that Stanfast has such a champion, she may well take down that dam of her own accord. Dunk did not know what to say to that. He knelt. My lord, I will go upon the morrow and do the best I can. On the morrow. The fly came circling back and lit upon Sir Eustace's left hand. He raised his right and smashed it flat. Yes, on the morrow. Another bath? Egg said, dismayed. You washed yesterday. And then I spent a day in armor swimming in my sweat. Close your lips and fill the kettle. You washed the night Sir Eustace took us into service, Egg pointed out. And last night, and now, that's three times, sir. I need to treat with a high-born lady. Do you want me to turn up before her high seat, smelling like Sir Bennis? You would have to roll in a tub of Maester's droppings to smell as bad as that, sir. Egg filled the kettle. Sam Stoop says the Castell in a cold mode is as big as you are. Lucas Inchfield is his name, but he's called the Long Inch for his size. Do you think he's as big as you are, sir? No. It had been years since Dunk had met anyone as tall as he was. He took the kettle and hung it above the fire. Will you fight him? No. Dunk almost wished it had been otherwise. He might not be the greatest fighter in the realm, but size and strength could make up for many lacks. Not for a lack of wits, though. He was no good with words, and worse with women. This giant Lucas Longinch did not dawn him half so much as the prospect of facing the Red Widow. I'm going to talk to the Red Widow, that's all. What will you tell her, sir? That she has to take the dam down. You must take down your dam, milady, or else... Ask her to take down the dam, I mean. Please give back our checky water. If it pleases her? A little water, milady, if it please you. Sir Eustace would not want him to beg. How do I say it, then? The water soon began to steam and bubble. Help me lug this to the tub, Dunk told the boy. 
Together they lifted the kettle from the hearth and crossed the cellar to the big wooden tub. I don't know how to talk with high-born ladies, he confessed as they were pouring. We both might have been killed in dawn on account of what I said to Lady Vaith. Lady Vaith was mad, Egg reminded him. But you could have been more gallant. Ladies like it when you're gallant. If you were to rescue the Red Widow the way you rescued that puppet girl from Arion. Arion's in lease, and the Widow's not in want of rescuing. He did not want to talk of Tanzel. Tanzel Too Tall was her name, but she was not too tall for me. Well, the boy said, some knights sing gallant songs to their ladies, or play them tunes upon a lute. I have no lute. Dunk looked morose. And that night I drank too much in the planky town, you told me I sang like an ox in a mud wallow. I had forgotten, sir. How could you forget? You told me to forget, sir, said Egg, all innocence. You told me I'd get a clout in the ear the next time I mentioned it. There will be no singing. Even if he had the voice for it, the only song Dunk knew all the way through was The Bear, The Bear, and The Maiden Fair. He doubted that would do much to win over Lady Weber. The kettle was steaming once again. They wrestled it over to the tub and upended it. Egg drew water to fill it for the third time, then clambered back onto the well. You'd best not take any food or drink at cold moat, sir. The Red Widow poisoned all her husbands. I'm not like to marry her. Eh? She's a high-born lady, and I'm Dunk of Flea Bottom, remember? He frowned. Just how many husbands has she had, do you know? Four, said Egg. But no children. Whenever she gives birth, a demon comes by night to carry off the issue. Sam Stoop's wife says she sold her babes unborn to the Lord of the Seven Hells, so he'd teach her his black arts. I bone ladies don't meddle with the black arts. They dance and sing and do embroidery. Maybe she dances with demons and embroiders evil spells, Egg said with relish. And how would you know what highborn ladies do, sir? Lady Vaith is the only one you ever knew. That was insolent, but true. Might be I don't know any highborn ladies. But I know a boy who's asking for a good clout in the ear. Dunk rubbed the back of his neck. A day in chain mail always left it hard as wood. You've known queens and princesses. Did they dance with demons and practice the black arts? Lady Shira does. Lord Bloodraven's paramour. She bathes in blood to keep her beauty. And once my sister Ray put a love potion in my drink, so I'd marry her instead of my sister Dela. Egg spoke as if such incest was the most natural thing in the world. For him, it is. The Targaryens had been marrying brother to sister for hundreds of years, to keep the blood of the dragon pure. Though the last actual dragon had died before Dunk was born, the dragon kings went on. Maybe the gods don't mind them marrying their sisters. Did the potion work? Dunk asked. It would have, said Egg. But I spit it out. I don't want a wife. I want to be a knight of the Kingsguard and live only to serve and defend the king. The Kingsguard are sworn not to wed. That's a noble thing. But when you're older, you may find you'd sooner have a girl than a white cloak. Dunk was thinking of Tanzel too tall, and the way she'd smiled at him at Ashford. Sir Eustace said I was the sort of man he'd hoped to have his daughter wed. Her name was Alisan. She's dead, sir. I know she's dead, said Dunk, annoyed. If she was alive, he said. If she was, he'd like her to marry me. Or someone like me. I never had a lord offer me his daughter before. His dead daughter? And the Osgreys might have been lords in the old days, but Sir Eustace is only a landed knight. I know what he is. Do you want a clout in the ear? 
Well, said Egg, I'd sooner have a clout than a wife. Especially a dead wife, sir. The kettle's steaming. They carried the water to the tub, and Dunk pulled his tunic over his head. I will wear my Dornish tunic to cold moat. It was sand silk, the finest garment that he owned, painted with his elm and falling star. If you wear it for the ride, it will get all sweaty, sir, Egg said. Wear the one you wore today. I'll bring the other, and you can change when you reach the castle. Before I reach the castle, I'd look a fool changing clothes on the drawbridge. And who said you were coming with me? A knight is more impressive with a squire in attendance. That was true. The boy had a good sense of such things. He should. He served two years as a page at King's Landing. Even so, Dunk was reluctant to take him into danger. He had no notion what sort of welcome awaited him at Coldmoat. If this Red Widow was as dangerous as they said, he could end up in a crow cage like those two men they had seen upon the road. "'You will stay and help Bennis with the small folk,' he told Egg. "'And don't give me that sullen look.' He kicked his breeches off and climbed into the tub of steaming water. "'Go on and get to sleep now and let me have my bath. You're not going, and that's the end of it.' Egg was up and gone when Dunk awoke, with the light of the morning sun in his face. "'Gods be good, how can it be so hot so soon?' He sat up and stretched, yawning then climbed to his feet and stumbled sleepily down to the well, where he lit a fat tallow candle, splashed some cold water on his face, and dressed. When he stepped out into the sunlight, Thunder was waiting by the stable, saddled and bridled. Egg was waiting, too, with Maester, his mule. The boy had put his boots on. For once he looked a proper squire, in a handsome doublet of green and gold checks and a pair of tight white woolen breeches. The breeches were torn in the seat, but Sam Stoop's wife sewed them up for me, he announced. The clothes were Adam's, said Sir Eustace, as he led his own grey gelding from his stall. A checky lion adorned the frayed silk cloak that fr flowed from the old man's shoulders. The doublet is a trifle musty from the trunk, but it should serve. A knight is more impressive with a squire in attendance, so I have decided that Egg should accompany you to Coldmoat. Outwitted by a boy of ten. Dunk looked at Egg and silently mouthed the words, Clout in the ear. The boy grinned. I have something for you as well, Sir Duncan. Come. Sir Eustace produced a cloak and shook it out with a flourish. It was white wool, bordered with squares of green satin and cloth of gold. A woolen cloak was the last thing he needed in such heat, but when Sir Eustace draped it about his shoulders, Dunk saw the pride on his face and found himself unable to refuse. "'Thank you, my lord. It suits you well.' Would that I could give you more. The old man's mustache twitched. I sent Sam Stoops down into the cellar to search through my son's things, but Edwin and Harold were smaller men, thinner in the chest and much shorter in the leg. None of what they had left would fit you, sad to say. The cloak is enough, my lord. I won't shame it. I do not doubt that. He gave his horse a pat. I thought I'd ride with you part of the way, if you have no objection. None, my lord. Egg led them down the hill, sitting tall on Maester. Must he wear that floppy straw hat? Sir Eustace asked Dunk. He looks a bit foolish, don't you think? Not so foolish as when his head is peeling, my lord. Even at this hour, with the sun barely above the horizon, it was hot. By afternoon, the saddles will be hot enough to raise blisters. Egg might look elegant in the dead boy's finery, 
but he would be a boiled egg by nightfall. Dunk at least could change. He had his good tunic in his saddlebag and his old green one on his back. We'll take the west way, Sir Eustace announced. It is little used these past years, but still the shortest way from Stanfast to Coldmoat Castle. The path took them around the back of the hill, past the graves where the old knight had laid his wife and sons to rest in a thicket of blackberry bushes. They loved to pick the berries here, my boys. When they were little, they would come to me with sticky faces and scratches on their arms, and I'd know just where they'd been. He smiled fondly. Your egg reminds me of my Adam. A brave boy for one so young. Adam was trying to protect his wounded brother Harold when the battle washed over them. A riverman with six acorns on his shield took his arm off with an axe. His sad gray eyes found Dunks. This old master of yours, the Knight of Pennytree, did he fight in the Blackfire Rebellion? He did, my lord, before he took me on. Dunk had been no more than three or four at the time, running half-naked through the alleys of Flea Bottom, more animal than boy. Was he for the Red Dragon or the Black? Red or black was a dangerous question, even now. Since the days of Aegon the Conqueror, the arms of House Targaryen had borne a three-headed dragon, red on black. Daemon the Pretender had reversed those colors on his own banners, as many bastards did. Sir Eustace is my liege lord, Dunk reminded himself. He has a right to ask. He fought beneath Lord Aford's banner, my lord. Green fretty over gold, a green pale wavy. It might be, my lord. Egg would know. The lad could recite the arms of half the knights in Westeros. Lord Hayford was a noted loyalist. King Daron made him his hand just before the battle. Butterwell had done such a dismal job that many questioned his loyalty. But Lord Hayford had been stalwart from the first. Sir Arlen was beside him when he fell. A lord with three castles on his shield cut him down. Many good men fell that day, on both sides. The grass was not red before the battle. Did your Sir Arlen tell you that? Sir Arlen never liked to speak about the battle. His squire died there too. Roger of Pennytree was his name, Sir Arlen's sister's son. Even saying the name made Dunk feel vaguely guilty. I stole his place. Only princes and great lords had the means to keep two squires. If Aegon the Unworthy had given his sword to his heir Daron instead of his bastard Daemon, there might never have been a Blackfire Rebellion and Roger of Pennytree might be alive today. He would be a knight someplace, a truer knight than me. I would have ended on the gallows or been sent off to the night's watch to walk the wall until I died. A great battle is a terrible thing, the old knight said. But in the midst of blood and carnage, there is sometimes also beauty beauty that could break your heart. I will never forget the way the sun looked when it set upon the red grass field. Ten thousand men had died, and the air was thick with moans and lamentations. But above us the sky turned gold and red and orange, so beautiful it made me weep to know that my sons would never see it. He sighed. It was a closer thing than they would have you believe these days. If not for Blood Raven. I'd always heard it was Baylor Breakspear who won the battle, said Dunk. Him and Prince Maker. The hammer and the anvil. The old man's mustache gave a twitch. 
the singers leave out much and more. Daemon was the warrior himself that day. No man could stand before him. He broke Lord Aaron's van to pieces and slew the Knight of Nine Stars and wild Will Wainwood before coming up against Sir Gwain Corbray of the King's Guard. For near an hour they danced together on their horses, wheeling and circling and slashing as men died all around them. It's said that whenever Blackfire and Lady Forlorn clashed, you could hear the sound for a league around. It was half a song and half a scream, they say. But when at last the lady faltered, Blackfire clove through Sir Gwain's helm and left him blind and bleeding. Daemon dismounted to see that his fallen foe was not trampled and commanded Red Tusk to carry him back to the maesters in the rear. And there was his mortal error, for the raven's teeth had gained the top of Weeping Ridge, and Blood Raven saw his half-brother's royal standard three hundred yards away, and Daemon and his sons beneath it. He slew Aegon first, the elder of the twins, for he knew that Daemon would never leave the boy while warmth lingered in his body though white shafts fell like rain. Nor did he, though seven arrows pierced him, driven as much by sorcery as by Blood Raven's bow. Young Amon took up black fire when the blade slipped from his dying father's fingers, so Blood Raven slew him too, the younger of the twins. Thus perished the black dragon and his sons. There was much and more afterward, I know. I saw a bit of it myself. The rebels running, bitter steel turning the rout and leading his mad charge. His battle with Blood Raven, second only to the one Daemon fought with Gwain Corbray. Prince Baylor's hammer blow against the rebel rear the Dornishmen all screaming as they filled the air with spears. But at the end of the day, it made no matter. The war was done when Daemon died. So close a thing. If Daemon had ridden over Gwain Corbray and left him to his fate, he might have broken Makar's left before Blood Raven could take the ridge. The day would have belonged to the Black Dragon then, with the hand slain and the road to King's Landing open before them. Daemon might have been sitting on the Iron Throne by the time Prince Baylor came up with his storm lords and his Dornishmen. The singers can go on about their hammer and their anvil, sir. But it was the Kinslayer who turned the tide with a white arrow and a black spell. He rules us now as well, make no mistake. King Eris is his creature. It would not surprise me to learn that Blood Raven had ensorcelled his grace to bend him to his will. Small wonder we are cursed. Sir Eustace shook his head and lapsed into a brooding silence. Dunk wondered how much Egg had overheard, but there was no way to ask him. How many eyes does Lord Bloodraven have, he thought. Already the day was growing hotter. Even the flies have fled, Dunk noted. Flies have better sense than knights. They stay out of the sun. He wondered whether he and Egg would be offered hospitality at Cold Moat. A tankard of cool brown ale would go down well. Dunk was considering that prospect with pleasure when he remembered what Egg had said about the Red Widow poisoning her husbands. His thirst fled at once. There were worse things than dry throats. There was a time when House Osgrey held all the lands for many leagues around, from Nunny in the east to Cobble Cove, Sir Eustace said. 
cold moat was ours, and the horseshoe hills, the caves at Daring Downs, the villages of Dosk and Little Dosk and Brandy Bottom, both sides of Leafy Lake. Osgrey maids wed Florence, swans and tarbecks, even high towers and blackwoods. The edge of Watts Wood had come in sight. Dung shielded his eyes with one hand and squinted at the greenery. For once, he envied Egg its floppy hat. At least we'll have some shade. Watts Wood once extended all the way to Cold Moat, Sir Eustace said. I do not recall who Watt was. Before the conquest, you could find Oryx in his wood, though, and great elks of twenty hands and more. There were more red deer than any man could take in a lifetime, for none but the king and the checky lion were allowed to hunt here. Even in my father's day there were trees on both sides of the stream, but the spiders cleared the woods away to make pasture for their cows and sheep and horses. A thin finger of sweat crept down Dunk's chest. He found himself wishing devoutly that his liege lord would keep quiet. It is too hot for talk. It is too hot for riding. It is too bloody hot. In the woods they came upon the carcass of a great brown tree cat, crawling with maggots. Ew, Egg said as he walked Maester wide around it. That stinks worse than Sir Bennis. Sir Eustace reined up. A tree cat? I had not known there were any left in this wood. I wonder what killed him. When no one answered, he said, I will turn back here. Just continue on the west way, and it will take you straight to Cold Moat. You have the coin? Dunk nodded. Good. Come home with my water, sir. The old knight trotted off, back the way they'd come. When he was gone, Egg said, I thought you should speak to Lady Weber, sir. You should win her to your side with gallant compliments. The boy looked as cool and crisp in his checky tunic as Sir Eustace had in his cloak. Am I the only one who sweats? Gallant compliments, Dunk echoed. What sort of gallant compliments? You know, sir. Tell her how fair and beautiful she is. Dunk had doubts. She's outlived four husbands. She must be as old as Lady Vaith. If I say she's fair and beautiful when she's old and warty, she will take me for a liar. You just need to find something true to say about her. That's what my brother Daron does. Even ugly old whores can have nice hair or well-shaped ears, he says. Well-shaped ears? Dunk's doubts were growing. Nor pretty eyes. Tell her that her gown brings out the color of her eyes. The lad reflected for a moment. Unless she only has the one eye, like Lord Bloodraven. My lady, that gown brings out the color of your eye. Dunk had heard knights and lordlings mouth such gallantries at other ladies. They never put it quite so baldly, though. Good lady, that gown is beautiful. It brings out the color of both your lovely eyes. Some of the ladies had been old and scrawny, or fat and florid, or pox-scarred and homely, but all wore gowns and had two eyes, and as Dunk recalled, they'd been well pleased by the flowery words. What a lovely gown, my lady. It brings out the lovely beauty of your beautiful colored eyes. A hedge knight's life is simpler, Dunk said glumly. If I say the wrong thing, she's like to sew me in a sack of rocks and throw me in her moat. I doubt she'll have that big a sack, sir, said Egg. We could use my boot instead. No, Dunk growled. We couldn't. When they emerged from Watts Wood, they found themselves well upstream of the dam. The waters had risen high enough for Dunk to take that soak he dreamed of. 
deep enough to drown a man, he thought. On the far side, the bank had been cut through and a ditch dug to divert some of the flow westward. The ditch ran along the road, feeding a myriad of smaller channels that snaked off through the fields. Once we cross the stream, we are in the widow's power. Dunk wondered what he was riding into. He was only one man, with a boy of ten to guard his back. Egg fanned his face. Sir, why are we stopped? We're not. Dunk gave his mount his heels and splashed down into the stream. Egg followed on the mule. The water rose as high as Thunder's belly before it began to fall again. They emerged dripping on the widow's side. Ahead, the ditch ran straight as a spear, shining green and golden in the sun. When they spied the Towers of Cold Moat several hours later, Dunk stopped to change to his good Dornish tunic and loosen his longsword in its scabbard. He did not want the blade sticking should he need to pull it free. Egg gave his dagger's hilt a shake as well, his face solemn beneath his floppy hat. They rode on side by side, Dunk on the big destrier, the boy upon his mule, the Osgrey banner flapping listlessly from its staff. Cold Moat came as somewhat of a disappointment, after all that Sir Eustace had said of it. Compared to Storm's End or High Garden and other lordly seats that Dunk had seen, it was a modest castle. But it was a castle, not a fortified watchtower. Its crenellated outer walls stood thirty feet high, with towers at each corner, each one half again the size of Standfast. From every turret and spire the black banners of Weber hung heavy each emblazoned with a spotted spider upon a silvery web. Sir, Egg said, the water, look where it goes. The ditch ended under Cold Moat's eastern walls, spilling down into the moat from which the castle took its name. The gurgle of the falling water made Dunk grind his teeth. She will not have my checky water. Come, he said to Egg. Over the arch of the main gate, a row of spider banners drooped in the still air, above the older sigil carved deep into the stone. Centuries of wind and weather had worn it down, but the shape of it was still distinct, a rampant lion made of checkered squares. The gates beneath were open. As they clattered across the drawbridge, Dunk made note of how low the moat had fallen. Six feet at least, he judged. Two spearmen barred their way at the portcullis. One had a big black beard and one did not. The beard demanded to know their purpose here. My lord of Osgrey sent me to treat with Lady Weber, Dunk told them. I am called Sir Duncan the Tall. Well, I knew you wasn't Bennis, said the beardless guard. We would have smelled him coming. He had a missing tooth and a spotted spider badge sewn above his heart. The beard was squinting suspiciously at Dunk. No one sees her ladyship unless the long inch gives his leave. You come with me. Your stable boy can stay with the horses. I'm a squire, not a stable boy, Egg insisted. Are you blind or only stupid? The beardless guard broke into laughter. The beard put the point of his spear to the boy's throat. Say that again. Dunk gave Egg a clout in the ear. No, shut your mouth and tend the horses. He dismounted. I'll see Sir Lucas now. The beard lowered his spear. He's in the yard. They passed beneath the spiked iron portcullis and under a murder hole before emerging in the outer ward. Hounds were barking in the kennels, and Dunk could hear singing coming from the leaded glass windows of a seven-sided wooden sept. In front of the smithy, a blacksmith was shoeing a warhorse, with a prentice boy assisting. Nearby, a squire was loosing shafts at the archery butts, while a freckled girl with a long braid matched him shot for shot. The quintain was spinning, too, 
as half a dozen knights in quilted padding took their turns knocking it around. They found Sir Lucas Longinch among the watchers at the Quintain, speaking with a great fat septon who was sweating worse than dunk, a round white pudding of a man in robes as damp as if he'd worn them in his bath. Inchfield was a lance beside him, stiff and straight and very tall, though not so tall as Dunk. Six feet and seven inches, Dunk judged, and each inch prouder than the last. Though he wore black silk and cloth of silver, Sir Lucas looked as cool as if he were walking on the wall. My lord, the guard hailed him. This one comes from the chicken tower for an audience with a ladyship. The septon turned first, with a hoot of delight that made Dunk wonder if he were drunk. And what's this? A hedge knight? You have large hedges in the reach. The septon made a sign of blessing. May the warrior fight ever at your side. I am Septon Sefton, an unfortunate name but mine own. And you? Sir Duncan the Tall. A modest fellow, this one, the septon said to Sir Lucas. Were I as large as him, I'd call myself Sir Sefton the Immense, Sir Sefton the Tower, Sir Sefton with the clouds about his ears. His moon face was flushed, and there were wine stains on his robe. Sir Lucas studied Dunk. He was an older man, forty at the least, perhaps as old as fifty, sinewy rather than muscular, with a remarkably ugly face. His lips were thick, his teeth a yellow tangle, his nose broad and fleshy, his eyes protruding. And he is angry, Dunk sensed, even before the man said, Hedge knights are beggars with blades at best, outlaws at worst. Be gone with you. We want none of your sort here. Dunk's face darkened. Sir Eustace Osgray sent me from Stanfast to treat with the lady of the castle. Osgray? The septon glanced at Longinch. Osgray of the Checky Lion? I thought House Osgray was extinguished. Near enough as makes no matter. The old man is the last of them. We let them keep a crumbling tower house a few leagues east. Sir Lucas frowned at Dunk. If Sir Eustace wants to talk with her ladyship, let him come himself. His eyes narrowed. You were the one with Bennis at the dam. Don't trouble to deny it. I ought to hang you. Seven, save us. The septon dabbed sweat from his brow with his sleeve. A brigand, is he? And a big one. Sir, repent your evil ways, and the mother will have mercy. The septon's pious plea was undercut when he farted. <laughs> oh, dear. Forgive my wind, sir. That's what comes of beans and barley bread. I am not a brigand, Dunk told the two of them, with all the dignity that he could muster. The long inch was unmoved by his denial. Do not presume upon my patience, sir. If you are a sir, run back to your chicken tower and tell Sir Eustace to give up Sir Bennis Brown's stench. If he spares us the trouble of winkling him out of Stanfast, her ladyship might be more inclined to clemency. I will speak with her ladyship about Sir Bennis and the trouble at the dam, and about the stealing of our water, too. Stealing, said Sir Lucas. Say that to our lady, and you'll be swimming in a sack before the sun is set. Are you quite certain that you wish to see her? The only thing that Dunk was certain of was that he wanted to drive his fist through Lucas Inchfield's crooked yellow teeth. I've told you what I want. Oh, let him speak with her, the septon urged. What harm could it do? 
Sir Duncan has had a long ride beneath this beastly sun. Let the fellow have his say. Sir Lucas studied Dunk again. Ah, uh, Septon is a godly man. Come, I will thank you to be brief. He strode across the yard, and Dunk was forced to hurry after him. The doors of the castle sept had opened, and worshippers were streaming down the steps. There were knights and squires, a dozen children, several old men, three septas in white robes and hoods, and one soft, fleshy lady of high birth, garbed in a gown of dark blue damask trimmed with mirish lace. So long its hems were trailing in the dirt. Dunk judged her to be forty. Beneath a spun silver net, her auburn hair was piled high, but the reddest thing about her was her face. "'My lady,' Sir Lucas said, when they stood before her in her septas, "'this hedge knight claims to bring a message from Sir Eustace Osgray. Will you hear it?' "'If you wish it, Sir Lucas.' She peered at Dunk so hard that he could not help but recall Egg's talk of sorcery. I don't think this one bathes in blood to keep her beauty. The widow was stout and square, with an oddly pointed head that her hair could not quite conceal. Her nose was too big and her mouth too small. She did have two eyes, he was relieved to see, but all thought of gallantry had abandoned Dunk by then. Sir Eustace bid me talk with you concerning the recent trouble at your dam. She blinked. The... dam, you say? A crowd was gathering about them. Dunk could feel unfriendly eyes upon him. The stream, he said. The checky water. Your ladyship built a dam across it. Oh, I am quite sure I haven't, she replied. Why, I have been at my devotions all morning, sir. Dunk heard Sir Lucas chuckle. I did not mean to say that your ladyship built the dam herself, only that... Uh, without that water, all our crops will die. The small folk have beans and barley in the fields, and melons. Truly, I am very fond of melons. Her small mouth made a happy bow. What sort of melons are they? Dunk glanced uneasily at the ring of faces, and felt his own face growing hot. Something is amiss here. Long Inch is playing me for a fool. Milady, could we continue our discussion in some... Uh, more private place? A silver says the great oaf means to bed her! Someone japed, and a roar of laughter went up all around him. The lady cringed away, half in terror, and raised both hands to shield her face. One of the septas moved quickly to her side and put a protective arm around her shoulders. "'And what is all this merriment?' The voice cut through the laughter, cool and firm. "'Will no one share the jape? "'Sir Knight, why are you troubling my good sister?' It was the girl he had seen earlier at the archery butts. She had a quiver of arrows on one hip and held a longbow that was just as tall as she was, which wasn't very tall. If Dunk was shy an inch of seven feet, the archer was shy an inch of five. He could have spanned her waist with his two hands. Her red hair was bound up in a braid so long it brushed past her thighs, and she had a dimpled chin, a snub nose, and a light spray of freckles across her cheeks. "'Forgive us, Lady Rohan.' The speaker was a pretty young lord with the Caswell centaur embroidered on his doublet. "'This great oaf took the Lady Hellicent for you.' Dunk looked from one lady to the other. "'You are the Red Widow?' he heard himself blurt out. "'But you too young?' The girl tossed her longbow to the lanky lad he'd seen her shooting with. I am five and twenty, as it happens. Or was it small, you meant to say? 
pretty. It was pretty. Dunk did not know where that came from, but he was glad it came. He liked her nose, and the strawberry blonde color of her hair, and the small but well-shaped breasts beneath her leather jerkin. I thought that you'd be... I mean, they said you were four times a widow, so... My first husband died when I was ten. He was twelve, my father's squire, ridden down upon the red grass field. My husbands seldom linger long, I fear. The last died in the spring. That was what they always said of those who had perished during the great spring sickness two years past. He died in the spring. Many tens of thousands had died in the spring, amongst them a wise old king and two young princes full of promise. I, uh, I'm sorry for all your losses, milady. A gallantry, you lunk. Give her a gallantry. I want to say, uh, your gown. Gown? She glanced down at her boots and breeches, loose linen tunic and leather jerkin. I wear no gown. Your hair, I meant. It's soft and... And how would you know that, sir? If you had ever touched my hair, I should think that I might remember. Not soft, Dunk said miserably. Red, I meant to say. Your hair is very red. Very red, sir? Oh, not as red as your face, I hope. She laughed and the onlookers laughed with her. All but Sir Lucas Longinch. My lady, he broke in, this man is one of Stanfast's cell swords. He was with Bennis of the Brown Shield when he attacked your diggers at the dam and carved up Wolmer's face. Old Osgray sent him to treat with you. He did, my lady. I am called Sir Duncan the Tall, Sir Duncan the Dim, more like, said a bearded knight who wore the threefold thunderbolt of Laygood. More guffaws sounded. Even Lady Hellicent had recovered herself enough to give a chuckle. Did the courtesy of Coldmote die with my lord father? the girl asked. No, not a girl, a woman grown. How did Sir Duncan come to make such an error, I wonder? Dunk gave Inchfield an evil look. The fault was mine. Was it? The Red Widow looked Dunk over from his heels up to his head, though her gaze lingered longest on his chest. A tree and shooting star. I've never seen those arms before. She touched his tunic, tracing the limb of his elm tree with two fingers. And painted, not sewn. The Dornish paint their silks, I've heard. But you look too big to be a Dornishman. Not all Dornishmen are small, my lady. Dunk could feel her fingers through the silk. Her hand was freckled, too. I'll bet she's freckled all over. His mouth was oddly dry. I spent a year in Dorn. Do all the oaks grow so tall there? She said as her fingers traced a tree limb round his heart. It's meant to be an elm, my lady. I shall remember. She drew her hand back, solemn. The ward is too hot and dusty for a conversation. Septon, show Sir Duncan to my audience chamber. It would be my great pleasure, good sister. Our guest will have a thirst. You may send for a flagon of wine as well. Must I? The fat man beamed. Well, if it please you. I will join you as soon as I have changed. Unhooking her belt and quiver, she handed them to her companion. I'll want Maester Carrick as well. Sir Lucas, go ask him to attend me. I will bring him at once, my lady, said Lucas Longinch. The look she gave her Castellan was cool. No need. I know you have many duties to perform about the castle. It will suffice if you send Maester Carrick to my chambers. Milady, Dunk called after her. My squire was made to wait by the gates. 
Uh, might he join us as well? Your squire? When she smiled, she looked a girl of five and ten, not a woman five and twenty. A pretty girl full of mischief and laughter. If it please you, certainly. Certainly.